Excellent. So Stephanie is not only a member of our core team, but also is going to like do all the smarts today. So Stephanie, give us a really quick intro. Like, how did you stumble into NetSquared Vancouver? Uh, I was a member of NetSquared in Toronto. Uh, and I, there's so many amazing workshops and I learned so many things from people who were, you know, smart and articulate and like doing amazing, inspiring work in their communities and like really rocking it. Um, so I moved to Vancouver a year ago. I had no friends. Um, I thought this would be a place to go to meet some friends. Um, and Eli was really nice to me. So thank you, Eli. Such a pleasure. You hear this story a lot, actually. There are 74 net squared groups scattered across the world. So as you travel from city to city, or maybe you move to a new city and you're like, where do I find my tribe? Talk to me, because one of the things I do in this world is actually support this global network of nonprofit technology meetups. So if you ever move to Dubai, let's talk. So when is the point where you decided, like, you were going to tame Excel as opposed to, like the rest of us, poking at it and hoping things are going to work. <laughs> okay, that's quite the question. Um, so my first, that's, that is a good question. Um, one of my favorite parts of math class when I was in high school was making charts and graphs. Um, and then, you know, you go into Excel, you put your data in, you press like the magic make chart button, and then it shows you something really ugly. And it's like, this, this could be better. You know, like this, this could be my brand colors. You know, this could be clear. This could be simple to read. This could not be Calibri. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of what brought me here today. Awesome. So uh, if you want to just continue from here, I'm going to get out of the way. You're going to take over. Um, thank you so much for being part of this today. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. It's Stephanie Tom. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Hold on. If you feel a little bit shy, just come up to me quietly afterwards and I can make sure we're, you're taken care of. Um, I'm also really shy, so I totally empathize with that. Um, great. Well, thank you guys for coming here today. I'm so glad that so many of you made it out on a chilly Vancouver night. Um, I know that it's, it's cold now. Like, that happened recently, um, so thank you for coming. Um, my name is Stephanie Butler. Um, I've been a member of Net Squared for a little while. Um, by day, I work for the Real Estate Foundation of BC, which is a grant maker. We make grants to sustainable land use projects. It has very little to do with real estate. If you're curious about it, come find me afterwards and we can talk. Um, you can find me on Twitter at writing quirky, and the hashtag is usually net2van. Is that still correct, Eli? Totally. Awesome, cool. We're like already on the right track. Um, so for this presentation, I'm assuming that most of you have a use case in mind when you're doing data visualizations. So you've got information you know you want to present and you have an idea in mind for where you're gonna, where you're gonna place it and what you want to say with your data visualization. Um, everything in this presentation is made with Excel. Um, there's other amazing software packages out there like Tableau, um, R, Processing. Um, Andrea can probably tell you a lot more about them. Um, but everything here is made with Excel, just because that's the tool that most of us have. Um, I work as a communications coordinator, so I'm a one-person communications team in a foundation that has a total staff team of eight. Um, so data visualization is like maybe half a percent of my job. But it's, it's a percent of, you know, half a percent that like maybe I really enjoy and you know, I think it could be done better. Um, so I'm just going to preface everything I say with that. So I'm not a bona fide expert, but I, I do believe in making things clear, consistent, easy to understand and read. Um, which is really the reason that most people use data to begin with. Usually because they've got some information, they've got some stats, they've got um, some data points, and they want to communicate that in a really clear, quick, visual way to an audience. So they have a use case in mind. Uh, great, so let's get started. You guys are probably bored with this slide. Cool. So we have five best practices. You guys don't need to write these down. I do have a handout. Um, we're going to be coming back to these a few times during the slide. So um, the best practices are choose the right chart for the job. Um, more often than not, the right chart is probably the simplest. Um, there's usually no need to make things complicated. Um, know in advance what you want to communicate. Eliminate clutter wherever possible. Use action colors to call attention to important points. And be descriptive. Use headlines, use labels, spell things out sometimes if you need to. Um, 
If you work in communications, you'll probably realize that most of these rules are very consistent with plain language communication. That's, that's not by accident, it's just keeping things simple and easy to understand is, is universal across disciplines. Um, so I'm gonna start tonight just with um, an example case. And so the example data I'm using is, uh, what is your favorite member of the Fellowship of the Ring? And for this example, I went to the Storm Crow Tavern on Commercial Drive, interviewed a whole bunch of the patrons and asked them, you know, who in the Fellowship do you like the best? And the possible answers are Gandalf, Aragorn, Boromir, Legolas, Gimli, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin. Does anyone here like, like Lord of the Rings? Okay. Thank you so much for, for validating my choice and example. I really appreciate that. Um, so you have some data and you plot that into Excel as one does. So I have a little table here, yay. Um, and you're thinking like, I wanna show the proportion of people in the Stormcrow Tavern who like particular characters. So you think, hey, let's, uh, let's visualize this. Let's uh, hit the make chart button and this is what we're gonna get, a pie chart, tasty. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's a few immediate issues with this chart, as, as you can see. Um, there's a legend on the side, which is really helpful, so you can, you can tell you know, which piece is which, but you have to go back and forth between the legend and the chart all the time. Um, and the values for each of the slices isn't immediately apparent. So for example, um, if I showed you this without having showed you the last slide, who is more popular, Gimli or Sam? Hearing a lot of crickets. <laughs> let's, let's cheat. Uh, Gimli's got eight votes and Sam's got seven. Good eye. Um, but that took a lot of work and it shouldn't have to take a lot of work because the whole point of using charts and graphs is to make things simple and clear and easy to understand. Um, so maybe in this use case, maybe a pie chart isn't the best choice. Um, another uh, weakness in the pie chart is that humans are really, really good at determining the length of things and making comparisons based on length. So these are two chart examples. They both show the exact same data, 65, 20, and 15, and it's shown in both a bar chart and a pie chart. Um, humans, again, as I mentioned, they're great at looking at lengths. So you kind of look at this and you like draw an invisible line with your brain there, and you can see that, hey, the red one's a little bit bigger than the blue one. Um, conversely, we're not as good at um, comparing angles to each other. That's just not a natural human ability, and we're also not very good at comparing area. Um, so when you look at the blue slice and the red slice, they look a lot closer together than they do in the bar chart. Um, that's part of the reason why graphics like this tend to trip us up, because when we see things in angles, we're not very good at telling the difference between them. Um, and adding more slices to the pie definitely exacerbates the problem because the slices get smaller and smaller as proportion and you have more slices that are similar in size. Um, the one way to make it even worse is to use 3D, <laughs> which completely distorts the proportion. Um, I, I, I really get why a lot of people like to use 3D graphs. Um, they look cool. They, they make your data seem more interesting. And I, I totally get that appeal, really I do. Um, but there are better and clearer ways to make your data more interesting than using a 3D chart. Um, is there a question? Well, these are 3D charts. What do you think you rotate? Uh, you probably could make it rotate. I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> but uh, that is definitely a thing you can do. Um, you can also compound it by exploding the chart. So here, at least this chart has like some good labels. You can tell that lemon has 14,000, peanut butter has 15,000, but the contrast is kind of low. Um, and then it, you do have to do a lot of reading to make the chart work. Um, and you can do even funner things like this. You can make the slices like get bigger, like steps. Um, kind of reminds me of a math textbook cover. Um, and here's just another example of how 3D kind of distorts things. So when I look at a graph like this, I'm not really sure where to measure. If I'm measuring from here or further up or somewhere in between. Um, so like there's good lines in the back, but I don't know like what part of the bar, the top of the bar I'm supposed to measure against. Um, so that, that kind of makes things confusing and distorted. Um, you can see that again here. Um, the chart kind of like tugs at my heartstrings a little bit because I'm from Toronto and I live in Vancouver and I really need to know which one's better. But this chart doesn't tell me that. <laughs> um, 
and some cheese ball examples because I went on Google Images and just looked up pictures of bad charts. And, um, the one on the uh, left is all shiny, and the one on the right has success arrows. Um, and here's another one where you have some similar <laughs> problem. I don't know, it's like it's melting or something. Um, the legend is like on the ground and it's distorted and it's really difficult to read. There's not a lot of contrast between the bars. Like there are labels there, good. Um, but some of them are like way down on the top and some of them are high up. It, it's, it's messy. So your takeaways, um, use a pie chart as a last resort, not your first resort. Um, and please don't use 3D. Um, if <laughs> pie charts for all of their weaknesses at, at making comparisons do have the advantage they can show you like a part of a whole, which I get has some appeal to it. Um, so if you must use a pie, use fewer slices. So two slices, three slices, four slices, but when you add more than that, the pieces just get too small to be meaningful. Um, and also consider a donut chart instead. Um, it, it sort of works the same way as a pie chart. So this is that 65, 15, and 20 again. But you kind of interpret this as curved lines. So you measure them almost like lines rather than as angles. Um, so it kind of has the same message, but um, is presented in a little bit of a clearer way. And it um, has a little bit more white space as well. So if you have designer friends like that. So here's our chart again. This is where we started. Um, so, so remembering what I said earlier about um, line graphs and bar graphs, it's much easier to make visual comparisons. So let's, let's try this as a line graph instead. Here's what we get. Thank you, Excel. Um, so, you know, we have a whole bunch of different bars here. You know, we've got some, some grid lines. We've got the labels uh, next to the data, which is, which is much better. Um, and, you know, you can see kind of clearly that, that Gandalf is the winner. Um, that's useful information. So back to those five best practices. Um, we have chosen the right chart for the job, done. We chose a really simple chart. Bar charts are really effective because they're really familiar. People are used to interpreting them. They see them all the time. Use that. Um, uh, other charts like line graphs, dot plots, slope graphs, um, they're better at handling other kinds of data. Um, but we can definitely get to that a little bit later. Um, so now that we've chosen the right chart, what do we want to communicate? Um, we want to show who the favorite characters are. Um, so one way to make that really clear would be to reorder the bars, starting with the largest at the top, going all the way down to the smallest. Um, for any like Lord of the Rings movie buffs out there, this is definitely not the order they appear in that like shallow, shadowed silhouette scene of them like walking against the sun. No? <laughs> okay. That's okay because um, we're using categorical data, so the order of the data doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but in this in this case, um, the the data point itself, so like how big each of the bars are, is the more interesting thing. Cool. So it's instantly easier to see the differences between each. Um, so looking at our five best practices again, um, number three is eliminate clutter. So so make things really easy, and you know. Um, Another way to call this is um, minimum viable product. So that's like a tech term. So what is like the most basic graph elements we need to tell the information? And how can we get rid of everything that doesn't um, contribute to the greater meaning? So here's our graph again. Um, there's something here that definitely doesn't contribute to the greater meaning. Can any of you guess what that might be? Oh, I see your hand. The extra labels on the right hand side. Yeah, we don't need that legend. We can read, we don't need to read it twice. Cool, let's get rid of it. Awesome. Um, there's a few other things here that aren't really doing anything for us. Um, these tick marks on the side. They're just there because they're part of the Excel default, but they don't actually add anything to the data. So let's just clean those up. And look, our lines are nice and straight. I like that. Um, and these, these data points would probably be a little bit easier to compare if the bars were a little bit thicker. Um, because then they're a little bit closer to each other. So a rule of thumb that some designers like is that the space between the bars should be about half the width of the bar. Um, you, you can vary that a little bit. Some people like really thick bars. Some people like them a little bit thinner. Um, sort of up to you. Um, so what else might be cluttering up this graph? Um, yeah. Uh, Yes, um, the grid lines. 
actually are, are they're really dark. Um, so if you're if you're a designer, things that are things that are darker call more attention than things that are lighter. And the grid lines here, they're they're quite dark. They're 100% black. So we can definitely, um, you know, fade those to the background and make them a little bit lighter, at least to begin with. Cool. So we just um, we just lightened up the grid lines. Great. Um, so one thing we could do to make the information more clear is we could add data labels here, just at the ends of the bars. Um, I once did this for a graph. Um, in my old office, and the executive director looked at it and was like, you're cheating. You just put the answers right on the graph. And I'm like, why, why are you trying to make things hard? So um, you're not cheating by putting the label right on the bar, just in case anybody was worried about that. Um, something else, um, because we have the labels right on the bars, we don't actually need the bottom axis. So we can get rid of that. That's clutter as well. Um, I will just add one caution that when you are getting rid of an axis and the axis labels, the, uh, the axis must always start at zero. Um, it's just ethics of data viz. So if I started that axis at like two, it would look like um, Mary and Boromir had like one vote and then, you know, it would just, it would distort things a little bit, so. We're totally going to get to that. You're going to love it. <laughs> okay, but th hold that thought. Um, cool. So we are going to get rid of that axis. Um, and because uh, we have data labels right on the bars, we actually don't need the grid lines at all. So let's just get rid of them. So already we have a much cleaner graph. There's a lot more white space. There's a lot of like space around the page for your eye. Um, it just looks a little bit friendlier. So going back to our five best practices, um, number four is using action colors, calling attention to the parts of the data that are really important, like Gandalf. Um, so to talk about action colors, um, I'm just going to use a really dorky analogy that I got from Colin Ware, who's a data scientist. Um, you are a mouse on the ground, you know, eating, eating nuts, doing mouse things, looking for cheese, trying to stay away from traps. Um, in the sky, there is an owl. Um, and you, you really want to know where that owl is in the sky because that owl is going to eat you. Um, but the problem with that is that owls in the sky don't usually have a label that says flying death next to them. Usually there's a whole bunch of other birds in the sky. And that makes it really hard for the mouse to see the owl right away. And the owl is like your really important data point. Um, so one way we can make that easier to see is, oh, and, sorry. Mice are also colorblind. I don't know. So that makes it, again, even harder. Um, but one way that we could make it easier for the mouse is if, hey, the only thing that was in color was the important data point, and we made everything else a little bit lighter and faded it to the background. And that really calls attention to that uh, owl in the sky, and we can add a data label. <laughs> so yeah, like huge difference there, right? So it's the same thing with your graph. So we have this graph here. All of the bars are in a different color, which is an Excel default. Um, let's just make it all gray, just, just for now, to fade everything to the background. Um, and looking at this, like, what are, what are the important points? Um, we already alluded that Gandalf being the most important, um, I would agree with that, is an important point. So we could give it an action color. We could make that, like, bright pinks. That's the first thing that your audience sees. Um, and everything else is just a little bit grayer. Um, maybe we want to say something different with this chart. Maybe we want to say that out of the two humans, Aragorn gets three times as many votes as Boromir. That's also a pretty valid point. Um, you know, when you're working with your own data, sometimes it's really helpful to start out with everything being gray, and then you can see, you know, in this exploratory stage, all of your data at the same level, like you can sort of pick out what the important things are and then use, use this as a starting point to tell the story to your audience. So, um, out of the two humans, uh, Aragorn was much more popular than Boromir. Sean Bean is sad. But anyways, um, we're going to assume just for this presentation that we're saying that Gandalf is the favorite. Um, so back to our five best practices. Number five is being descriptive, using headlines and labels to your advantage. So we have a headline up here. It's favorite Fellowship of the Ring character, and it's getting a ton of real estate. It's like right at the top of the graph there. It's like the first thing you see. Um, maybe we could use that space in a more, more effective way. 
um, maybe we could tell a little bit of a story with it. Um, or as my old ED would say, we would be cheating. Um, so here's a cheaty headline. Um, Gandalf is the best member of the fellowship. And then we have a subhead saying, according to Storm Crow Tavern patrons. Um, it's a descriptive headline. It says what's exactly in the chart. And because we already have an action color established with Gandalf, we can pull that into the headline. And now there's like a visual relationship between the name Aragorn and the headline, that important point, and the point on the graph. Or you could conversely do kind of the same thing here with Aragorn and Boromir. Um, so we've gone through these five best practices. That was really quick. Um, bonus, making things look great. Um, so we have our chart here. You know, already we've come a long way. Um, but there's still a few more tweaks, things that we could do to make it look a little bit better. Um, so for the typeface, use a sans serif font. It's just a little bit easier to read, especially when you're, when you're working in charts. Um, I would recommend you go beyond Calibri, which is the default font in Excel. Um, for most of my slides, I'm using Open Sans, which is a Google font. You can download that for free. Um, if you are using a non-default font on like a PowerPoint or in a Word doc, you might have to embed it or export it as a PDF, just as an FYI. But there's other amazing options out there like Helvetica and Arial, really simple, clear, easy to understand fonts. Um, make sure your type is large enough to read clearly um, and use bold and underline collectively. So made some typography changes. I would put this um, in open sans, and it's just a little bit, a little bit less default looking. Um, for color, use colors and tints that are high contrast and color blind friendly. We're already achieving that. Um, there are some amazing web tools online if you want to test for color blind, color blindness. Um, a lot of people in data viz will like automatically default to using like traffic like colors, like red, yellow, green, for like something needs attention, something's almost there, something's complete. Um, that might work really well for you, but if somebody's color and the red and the green will look really similar. So just remember that. Um, dark gray is usually easier to read than black. Um, the reason for that being like in nature, almost nothing you would see would be 100% black. Um, even a shadow is a really dark gray. Um, and there's just, a, it reduces eye strain. So the longer you read something, if it's a dark gray, it's a little bit easier. Um, don't use more than two action colors because it becomes confusing and then we end up going right back to where we began. Um, and you can use action colors on your labels too. Um, by the way, I have a handout. So I've got a few printed copies of it and I'll also post the PDF to the website because there's a lot of URLs in it, but I'll totally pass that around afterwards because it'll be much more useful, useful than my slides, which are mostly pictures. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, Um, an action color is a color that calls attention to a, specific, to, a, to a piece of data. So you could say it's a charming color. You could use like a brand color. So if you're Coca-Cola, you'd want to use like that particular shade of red. If you're Facebook, you'd want that blue. Um, you know, maybe you want to use 100% black as your action color and have everything else faded to a light gray. Um, if you're printing in black and white, that would work. Um, I would use no more than two, maybe three action colors, because otherwise it's just too many colors at once and you want to um, sort of fade out the less important pieces and keep the things that are really important that you want your audience to notice and keep those really bright and vivid. So if we followed those rules, this is kind of what it would look like. The type would be like a really dark gray. Um, you know, everything is like really clean, it's easy to read, and you can see that this is a lot different from this. Um, Cool. Um, but wait, <laughs> bar charts are, are great, um, but there are also a lot of other amazing options and a lot of these principles will work no matter which options you're using. Um, so I just pulled a few examples here. We're not gonna go through them in quite as much detail. Um, so here's a clustered column chart um, where I've used an action color um, to pull out what the final films in some trilogies were and another action color to pull out the first film for The Hobbit, and then middle films for The Matrix and Bourne trilogies. Um, and I've used the labels really selectively because if I labeled every single data point, it would look really cluttered. Um, so in this case, it tells a story about you know, which film was most, uh, most highest grossing, and I kept the axis because I was taking away some of those, those data labels. 
Um, another option that's really good for before and after is a dot plot. Yeah. Um, so the gray would be the starting point, and you've got this an axis of 0 to 100% along the bottom. Um, so in this case, it was a public opinion survey where we used A-B tests, and we tried different types of words to see how concerned people got about them. So in this case, um, the public concern jumped from 56 to 75% when we changed the term from affordable housing to cost of housing. Maybe that's because people are selfish. Um, and and um, sort of similarly from climate change to extreme weather, from loss of agricultural land to food security. So the headline I wrote for this was that people were more concerned about consequences than underlying issues. I mean, you could interpret that a little bit differently if you wanted to. Um, and in the handout, I've got some really good resources for how to make dot plots. Um, but for those who are really impatient, basically it's um, two sets of dots. Um, you make the points really, really big, and you put them on a fake y-axis to space them out. Um, Excel doesn't make these automatically. You can just kind of force them out. Um, here's another one. It's a line graph. Um, so it's... Uh, a gala, the revenues were declining, but they rebranded it in 2015, and you can see that the revenues grew again. I've got an action color called to that rebrand. I've like pointed it out, and you can see really clearly um, what's happening there. Um, and our friend the pie. I, I don't hate the pie quite as much when it's just one data point. You've got an action call. You're calling something out. You're saying really clearly 33% of donations are made online. Um, in this example, you might have like four other ways to make the donation, but I've combined them all into one super category because the important point I wanted to call out was 33%. Um, this also works in um, a donut chart as well, so depending on your preference. Um, how are we for time, Eli? I think you're doing fabulous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so line charts, I really, I really like line charts. They're really useful for showing um, progression over time. Um, one thing that goes really badly with line charts is when you have a whole bunch of lines, you want to graph them together, and you get like spaghetti. This, this, this looks like spaghetti. Um, otherwise, it's followed all the rules. Like it's, you know, the, the grid lines are faded to the background. Um, you know, you're using some distinct colors, but like it's a lot of things at once. So uh, there is a couple strategies for handling this, um, but the answer really is small multiples. So calling out each line individually and putting them all together on the same scale. Um, so there's sort of two ways of handling that. Here's an example where, say, I wanted to look at um, one type of award category. You can gray out the things that are less important. They're still there. But you're not hiding the data, um, but you're, you're, you're pulling one for, to the forefront. Um, another option is separating them all into individual small graphs. Um, so this, again, is really user-friendly. Um, it works because the scale is identical on each graph. Um, I didn't, like, zoom in on the bottom one because the numbers were smaller. The scale has to be the same. Um, and you can see this used, like, this is an example from the Pew Research Center. They use small multiples as well just because it's a lot easier for the audience um, to see the difference. So um, those five best practices, again, we're choosing the right chart for the job, knowing what you want to communicate, so writing a really good headline. That's actually probably your biggest bang for your buck. Um, eliminating the clutter and the things that aren't doing anything to support your point. Um, using an action color, being descriptive, using head headlines and labels strategically. And I just have a slide of useful internet places. Um, Stephanie Evergreen is an amazing blogger. She writes a lot of tutorials on how to make a lot of these charts in Excel. Um, Cole Nussbaumer Naflick writes the blog Storytelling with Data. I liked her so much, I bought her book. Um, it's not very expensive, so if you want to take a look at it, I can like loan it out. Um, but it's like 35 bucks, which is totally reasonable for a textbook. Um, and there's a couple other blogs, Anne K. Emery, she's an evaluation expert. Um, Nancy Duarte writes about um, presentations and persuasion and designing a really good slide deck. Um, Data Assist is a blog set up by an agency. Um, Stephen Few and Edward Tuft are both academics who work in data visualization. This is like, this is their shtick. Um, Excel Charts is another great blog, and if you're looking for some inspiration, there's the Information is Beautiful Awards. Um, and all of that is on my handy handout. 
And if you're looking for a little bit more, there's the hashtag DataViz on Twitter. Um, there's always some really good conversation there and lots of smart people who are amazing. Smart people like Andrea, who's going to be presenting next. <laughs>